And then I uh, see Dr. Louie would have been last week, right? Yeah. yeah. I know Doc Meyer always always has some fun stuff there with um, uh, nutritionfacts.org and Dr. Greger, I think, is, is kind of his, his favorite. But, you know, I, I uh, actually, and you, you said, what's all these big words, you know, and I like that. Because I, I actually have this slide, kind of the introduction slide, and, and I had that across the top, and I looked at that, and I'm going, you know, I look at that, and you just kind of get this sinking feeling like, great, we're back in biochemistry. <laughs> um, you know, and, and I don't want that. Uh, you know, even though biochemistry is fascinating, I just don't want folks overwhelmed. And so I flipped it around, and I said, you know, what we're doing is we're taking a look at what we eat, how it affects the balance of our intestinal microbiome, so that that's just a term we use to, to, to uh, reference all of the organisms in, in our uh, GI tract and how this, this uh, intestinal um, microbiome, uh, the relationship, how it affects our health. And, and I think, you know, you, you folks know this, this is the, the sole purpose of this class. You know, over two and a half years ago we started this class every week because it's just so important. We want to help folks understand how to uh, improve health and decrease the need for medications. And um, you know, and that, that's what, what gets me excited. So then I put the, the big words down here in a little smaller lettering. So you know, when, when we're looking at that study that was released, published online in February 2015, um, you know, I'm I'm just going. Wow! In essence, that's exactly what what we're what we're looking at. The the polyphenols, the the intestinal microbiota, and uh, the interactions of of our body. And you know, I just this this little uh, uh, cartoon I think just kind of sum summarizes. You know, the, here's here's the GI tract sitting on one side of the table, going, you know, got to move for a brain. You know, and, and that's exactly what we're doing, we're wrapping our minds around, uh, you know, what we're actually putting into our mouth and the, the total body response that, that we have. Well, every week I'd like to start with, with a, a thought from, from Scripture and, you know, it's, it, there's, there's just so many, um, you know, texts out there. I think the last time I was here we talked about Daniel. Uh, you know, the, the biblical reference of, of how just a, a change in diet increased, uh, you know, function ten times greater than their, than their peers. Uh, Genesis 1, 29 and 30, um, uh, New English uh, translation, Then God said, I now give you every seed-bearing plant in the face of the entire earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. So it's just to outline for us what the the, the first diet uh, was. And to all the animals of the earth, and to every bird of the air, and to all creatures that move on the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. It was so. You know, and and it just it kind of starts getting our minds wrapped around the fact that you know our our the first diet was not rich in in meat. It was not rich in processed foods. It was it was very simple, and it was it was very real, and and it was growing and and created for us to use as a food source. So in this class, we, we started looking at all the scientific evidence and, and reasons why we need to get ourselves back on track and back realigned with that, uh, that first diet that God gave us. So let's uh, begin with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful Sabbath morning and thank you for each individual that's here today as we discuss health the effects on, on our health by what we eat. Uh, we ask for your presence to be in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So, testimonies. You know, I think this is one, one very important part of it. So each one of us, we, we have a story, right? 
And so if you don't have one today, be thinking, you know, what is it that, you, that you're challenged with? What's, what are, are some things that you run into on a daily or weekly basis? And, and how can you help others? You know, uh, someone that, that struggles with sugar, um, you know, where's, where's Heidi at? Or, or a resident chocoholic. But, you know, it's, it's just, it's important. Um, you know, I think last I was here last month, uh, you know, Heidi shared, you know, she, she's really getting on top of this. You know, and, and I'm going, wow, what a, what a blessing, what a, what a challenge. Does anybody have something they want to share? Yeah. Okay. Well, mine is also sugar. Okay. Uh, and when you work and you're working, you know, you sometimes you start getting depleted in energy. Uh -huh. You want something fast. So everybody brings donuts and cakes and cookies and ice cream. So I told myself I'm not going to eat any of that. Mm. But I was I was doing cupcakes. I was doing cookies. And so I decided to, to take myself some um, fruits, berries and strawberries, and I took them over to work along with vegetables. Mm -hmm. And what I did was that every time I wanted to get a cupcake, I would tell, I, would, I had a little, a little card that says you can do all things to Christ who gives you strength. Mm -hmm. So I would read that and read it and read it and I'd go like, uh, I use the five second thing too, and I'm like, five, four, three, two, one, and I read that, and I'm like, that's nice. it, I'm leaving, you know. And then I would get some berries, so I would get a banana, I would get um, some of the fruits that I had there. And so far, I've been able to be, like a whole month, that I've been able to not eat any of the sugars that they have brought there. Wow. And some of the other people are starting to bring less sugars and they're bringing more of the fruits and vegetables mm -hmm. and no more chocolates. Everybody comes wow. running to our department for chocolates. Where are all the chocolates? Uh, I was like, no more chocolates. So And you're, you're going here, have, a, have an apple. Yeah, and, uh, 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 and they've already started bringing out more fruit cups and more nice. vegetable cups and everybody's becoming more health conscious. Nice. So um, it's helping out. Wow, very awesome. <laughs> Very awesome. Yeah, so it's it's kind of that, that cognitive retraining, isn't it? Yes. We, we kind of, instead of going after a, a cookie, we start going, you know, yeah, I can, I can have an apple or, or an orange and, and I, can be, I can be satisfied and, and, and very happy, you know, all, all the way around. So awesome, awesome story. Very Great good. testimony. Anybody else? Yeah. At my work, I always bring a bowl of my own salad bean mix for years and years. But now my coworkers, they both, we all sitting down, they've got their big bowls of cabbage shredded with beans and nuts in it. Wow. And so it's turning over. And Tuesdays, one day a week, I start bringing a little crock pot with beans. Just put it out there, eat it or not. Nice. Bring your own additives. And now they miss it when I missed one. And so nice. Kind of. Counting on real food. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. it. Real food, huh? That is that is so awesome. Very good. Good morning. Yes. Good morning. I uh, went to the doctor yesterday, and they took me down. I'm on the lowest dose of one medication. Okay. Cut it uh, in half. Very awesome. Nice guy. Be careful. You're getting healthy on us. <laughs> you know, I I love it. I I love it because that's you know when when I. I can look at, at uh, you know, one of my patients and say those very words. I can say, be careful, you're getting healthy. i, I got to tell you, the smiling muscles kick right in, <laughs> you know, because it's, it's an awareness that, that we are, are making a positive difference, and, and we have a lot to say. Mm -hmm. You have a lot to say about how many medications and what dose. It's pretty, pretty incredible. Thanks for sharing. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Yes. It's been a long time since she told me to eat breakfast. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I couldn't figure out why it would be so important because I ate about lunch. Mm -hmm. and I'm in my breakfast and lunch combined. And um, I started about two months ago. 
Mm -hmm. Restarted eating breakfast. Awesome. And you know, it does just just like you said. It it takes the hunger away from me. Awesome. And in the evening, in the afternoon, I eat a little bit. Okay. So it kind of helps set the stage for for your day then. Gives you energy. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Not good exercise. No. No. Be careful. You can get healthy on us. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? I can sound sound like a broken record, and it, uh -huh. it just fits. Anybody else? All right. Very awesome. And and I think that it's it reinforces for for each one of us when when we can hear. Stories like, yeah, eating breakfast has made a difference. Yeah, you know, uh, making changes at work. Um, you know, is, is just people are are getting getting more aware of, of total body response, uh, reduction of medications. Uh, you know, you, you just you you gotta gotta love it. And so this next week, as as we all go through through our day, you know, kind of remembering some of these testimonies. And going, you know what? Yeah, I can I can make a difference in in my own life here as well. So, you know, kind of kind of like uh, James alluded to, you know, the, these big words. Well, I I think it's important. Um, you know, I I've had this slide before, but I just I kind of wanted to do a, a brief, you know, touch base on things like uh, phenol. Is a weakly acidic organ or organic compounds uh, molecules containing one or more hydroxyl group. Well, that's that's basically an oxygen and hydrogen that are, are stuck together, and and so we're we're not going to we're not going to turn this into organic chemistry class. But you know, just just so when when there's reference in polyphenol, poly means many. So, so now we've got all these little phenols, we're going to bring them together, microbiome we've talked about, and that's just a reference of all the different organisms. Any ideas how many different organisms, um, different species do you feel but that we have in our, in our GI tract? I think we touched on that last month. A trillion. A, a trillion, okay. So how many different species? Oh. <laughs> I forgot. There's 10 to the 14th or something. Yeah, well, that's how many organisms. Okay. So, <laughs> believe it or not, there's about four to 500 different species. But you're absolutely right. I mean, 10 to the 14th. So, you take 10 and you add 14 zeros. That's approximately how many organisms we're, we're uh, dealing with and looking at through our GI tract. Okay? I mean that that's kind of you know let that sink in a little bit. We we got to wrap our mind around that. How many times uh, this this is for those of you who have been in this class and we we've touched on this. How many times more metabolically active is our GI tract than our liver? Our liver's pretty pretty metabolically active. I'm thinking a hundred. You thought right. <laughs> One hundred times more metabolically active. So our GI tract is wow, major, major uh, chemist at work here. Uh, I added short chain fatty acids. Just uh, we we've referenced these in the past, and and hopefully you all kind of remember. Oh yeah, that's a positive thing. You know, because we, we get a lot of sh uh, short-chain fatty acids as vegetarians because we're eating fiber. We're eating fruit, has a lot of fiber. We're eating vegetables, has a lot of fiber. We're really eating whole grains, has a lot of fiber. Well, that fiber is broken down, and I, I kind of add this little blurb from uh, Wikipedia, so I can just do a quick copy-paste. And it was talk, talking about the short chain fatty acids are produced when di dietary fiber is fermenting, uh, fermented in the colon. Okay, so so in other words, these these fibers that are really non-digestible are actually uh, being broken down in the colon, and you can you can guess what's what's playing a role there. That would be the organisms, right? Mm -hmm. Helping break down these things. Uh, they they. Uh, Added an example that I uh, we're we're going to be hitting on this. It's it's just so important 
The short chain fatty acid uh, butyrate is particularly important for colon health because it's primary energy. It's the primary source of energy for colonic cells and has anti-carcinogenic uh, as well as anti-inflammatory properties. So in that one sentence, I, I've just kind of given some insight as to one of the most effective cancer treatment programs out there. And it has to do with the, with the butyrate. Uh, these are important for keeping colon cells healthy. In fact, we're going to discuss later how they even protect our, our colon cells. Uh, butyrate inhibits the growth and proliferation of tumor cells. Uh, induces differentiation of tumor cells, producing a phenotype similar to that of, of normal mature cells. So it says, hey, wait a minute, cancer cells, you can't be that weird. You know, I'm, I'm going to straighten you up a little bit. And so butyrate steps in and starts going, wow, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start turning down the heat on some of these cancer cells. And, you know, it's, it's pretty exciting when, and when we start recognizing the complexity of what's going on, I mean, you know, it, it, it becomes undeniable. You know, this, this isn't just something that's, that's evolving. This, this had the master chemist, uh, you know, in, in uh, planning and, and in the creation uh, process. Um, and it induces apoptosis or programming cell death of human colorectal cancer cells. So apoptosis is, is again, just kind of uh, butyrate going, I'm, I've got a bullseye on you and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cause you to just kind of go boom. And it's kind of kind of wild that, uh, you know, we've, we've got that going on in, in our bodies on, on a regular uh, basis. So pretty, pretty awesome stuff and you're going, whoa, we started out talking about short chain fatty acids and now we're talking about big stuff. You know, like uh, cancer prevention and, and literally uh, destruction and or modification of uh, cancer cells. So some, some pretty, pretty awesome terms. I just kind of wanted to plant those seeds so that as, as we go, you're kind of going, oh yeah, I remember that uh, short chain fatty acid stuff. So some, some definitions, um, microbial diversity of the human gut, and, and we had gone through the introduction, I just, uh, the handout today, I just, I gave you the introduction, the abstract, and, and uh, so if you didn't get one, there's hopefully some more on the, on the back table there. Um, and, and basically, I just kind of wanted to pick up and, and, uh, and keep moving, because it is, Kind of like we were, we were talking about before class, you know, it's, uh, who was the doc that you were listening to? Um, he came out on TED, TED Talk. Okay. Um, and he's, he's from Ireland. I forgot his name. I think okay. he his name when I get home. Who was that? Was it Gregor? I don't remember. I know he Is Gregor from Ireland? Ireland? Yeah. Know. He's, he's a psychologist and he's doing research on microbiome. Uh, and the connection with the brain. The connection that we have with the intestinal tract and with the brain. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Pretty pretty fun. Yeah. So you're you're right. It fits. Uh, it definitely fits. So the human gut is colonized, and man, Margot alluded to this number ten to the fourteenth. Um, you know, number of bacterial cells, uh, ten times more than the total number of human cells in, in, our, in our bodies. Uh, metabolic capacity of the intestinal micro, uh, microbiome is approximately 100 uh, fold greater than that of the human liver. This is a result of the great diversity of bacterial species forming the population and hence the large number of genes which they contain. So, you know, we're, we're going, wow, pretty, pretty and incredible stuff. <coughs> so, when we, when we talk about the GI tract, you know, I, I kind of like uh, we, we talked about last month, you know, where does digestion uh, start? Brain. That's how you say brain. Mouth. Okay, so what happens when, when we're chewing? Saliva. 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 Okay. So, do we drink a lot of water with with meals? No. Why? They're living with saliva. 
makes it so our body doesn't produce as much saliva. You know, so, so little things like that. I mean, if we're drinking a large amount of, of uh, fluid with, with our meals, our body's not going to produce as much saliva. Uh, we're, we're actually inhibiting that first uh, stage of, of digestion. And, and again, kind of a, a review. But we, we look at, uh, you know, just structurally, we, we have our esophagus about 10 inches in length. Okay, so we've got our mouth, the esophagus, the human stomach lies between the esophagus and the duodenum for smart, uh, part of the small intestine. Um, in adult humans, the stomach has a relaxed, near empty volume, about 75 milliliters. Um, because it's distendable, it is a distendable organ, it normally expands to hold about one liter of food. So if you think about a two liter bottle, you know, and, and here we're, you know, sometimes it's kind of hard to, to talk about milliliters and yeah, five milliliters in a, in a teaspoon, you know, just to kind of, kind of put it into, into uh, terms that we might be a little more familiar with. And so you're going, okay, a two liter bottle, I'm going to say, visualize about half of that. That's about the size of the stomach, okay? So we got the esophagus, the stomach, the, the small intestine. Um, you know, uh, the length of the small intestine can vary greatly from as short as uh, 9 feet to as long as 34. You know, when, when you have a gentleman that's 6 foot 8, he's probably going to have a little bit more of, you know, along the lines of a longer, um, you know, small intestine than, than someone that's, that's just uh, smaller. So, so some average there, average length of around 3 to 5 meters. Um, overall in humans, the large intestine, so now we, we've gone through the small intestine, now we have the large intestine, which is also referenced as the colon, and that's about five feet long, um, and approximately one-fifth of the whole length of the, the GI tract is, is a reference there. So when we start talking about, you know, organisms, um, you know, we, we just start thinking about all the different segments, the esophagus, the stomach, the small intestine, the, the colon or large intestine, and, and that's kind of kind of where we're, we're visualizing, you know, all of these different organisms um, being in, in place. The composition as well as the rate, ratio of different species that form the intestinal microbiome is also very diverse within the human population. The composition of the human gut ecosystem is influenced by multiple and diverse factors such as age, origin, you know, it's kind of wild when you start thinking about, well, you know, so somebody from uh, Norway uh, may have a completely different, uh, you know, microbiome composition as somebody from uh, uh, Japan uh, or, or uh, Puerto Rico or, or something like that. And, and so it's just kind of fascinating when you start looking at all the, the diversity out there. Uh, dietary habits uh, include probiotics and the application of antibiotics. So, you know, it kind of makes sense if, if we are, um, you know, we, we get sick a, a couple of times a year and, uh, you know, you, you go to the doctor, he puts you on an antibiotic. Well, what's the antibiotic going to do? It's going to kill. It's going to kill the good and the bad, isn't it? And so you know, and that's that's uh, you know where it's just important to understand. Yeah, go out and get a probiotic that um, you you can you can actually take while on the antibiotic, and then for a week or two after, uh, because we've got to protect our microbiome. So it kind of starts affecting uh, you know our our mind. Um, you know, as, as a walk-in provider, I, I would have folks come in, I was, I was doing a lot of incisions and, and drainages of, of abscesses uh, formed typically by um, uh, Staph aureus, specifically methicillin resistant. So if you've ever heard of MRSA, it's a methicillin resistant Staph aureus. So, you know, somebody comes in and they, they've got this abscess, I'm incising, draining, packing, uh, and then allowing it to heal from the inside out. Usually I have to put them on at least a couple of antibiotics at the same time. And, um, you know, to, to achieve, uh, you know, positive results. 
And, and so when you have somebody on, you know, massive amounts of antibiotics, you know, we're, we're definitely negatively influencing the microbiome. And that's, that's definitely a downside. So when there's not a thought of protecting that microbiome, you know, what, what are some things that can, that can happen? So I put you on two antibiotics. I'm wiping out everything. Mm. Now all of a sudden we open the door. Diarrhea. Diarrhea. Okay. Absolutely. So our, our GI tract, you know, oftentimes we just start feeling really yucky. You know, almost like flu-like symptoms. Um, you know, abdominal cramping. Uh, opportunistic uh, organisms like C. difficile uh, come in and now we have watery diarrhea that's not going to go away uh, and, and then we really start having having concerns becoming very dehydrated um, and not to mention malnutrition and everything else and yeast, and yeast infections mm -hmm. absolutely so opportunistic organisms then start coming in and all of a sudden now we're going to use a term called dysbiosis, where we'll, we'll say dysbiosis, a.k.a. chaos. Because mm -hmm. that's exactly what we're doing. We're, we're creating chaos in, that, uh, in our GI tract. And so when chaos moves in, that's kind of the exciting part that I, that I see with this study as we go. I want you to just be thinking about, okay, chaos moves in. What does this move mean for me? Okay, and to just put it in a nutshell, a variety of disease processes can be associated. So, hence each individual has his or her his or her own unique profile of microbial species, which can be compared to a fingerprint. Wow, isn't that cool? Mm -hmm. Owing to the multiple of direct and indirect interactions with the host organism, the intestinal microbiome is closely linked to the health of the host. And you know, when, when a study like this comes out, you're you're just sitting here going, wow. You know, now now we're we're getting to the to the you know where the rubber meets the road here. <coughs> So, the, uh, despite the great diversity of bacterial species, the uh, majority, 98% of all species, belong to only four bacterial phyla. And the only reason I put these up here is um, the significance of, of ratios. So, uh, basically, the first 64% in, in the, the phyla of uh, Firmicutes. And then 23% in, in Bacter, Bacteroides. Proteobacteria, 8%. And Actinobacteria, about 3%. And so we're, we're just kind of going, wow, now, now we've got four major uh, groups that these organisms uh, you know, belong to. The ratio between these groups is strongly dependent on the location within the intestine and on the ethnicity of, of the host. And again, that's, that's from where you're at, um, you know, that, that's going to make a, a difference. Fernicutes and Bacteroides, I'm not pronouncing that right, Bacteroides, dominate in the large intestine, while in the je jejunum, proteobacteria are more abundant than Bacteroides. Um, there's a, another uh, um, form of, of the bacteroids that is uh, pathogenic. Yeah. Um, one of the weirder things that says you can change your microbiome within days, depending on what you eat, and some mm -hmm. under the location too would change depending on the environment you're in. Yeah, absolutely. So it's pretty quick to fix or wreak havoc on your biome. Mm -hmm. Isn't that? Yeah, you know, and, and that's it. I mean, you know, back to the antibiotic. Well, of course, the antibiotic is going to be very quick acting, but yeah, with, within you know 24 to 48 hours, uh, it can it can have a, a profound negative effect. Well, this, fiber or no fiber. Fiber or no fiber. Fast. <laughs> yeah, exactly, and and that's where you know, 
a lot of folks recognize, uh, you know, the, the change uh, in, in like uh, bowel movement. You know, they they go on a trip and and they maybe don't drink in, as much water, or they're eating a different type of food than they would uh, actually uh, be eating at home. And you know, and all of a sudden they're sitting here going, "Wow, you know, I'm I'm." I, now I've got GI problems, and and so yeah, that's that's yeah. pretty profound. They have a lot of control in that. Absolutely, absolutely. <clears throat> so I just kind of wanted to introduce you to those those terms because they they actually are are looking at these ratios. Um, in fact, uh, the the firmicutes and the uh, uh, bacteroides. Uh, they they call that the FB ratio, and they they literally look at that, and and there there is even suggestions that that ratio be looked at with uh, with a view of what diseases do we see more more uh, commonly with with folks that maybe have more firmicutes than bacteroides. Yes. I was listening to a program, and as I'm hearing you, I think it may have to do with this uh -huh. of the um, immune system in children uh -huh. that have asthma. More children have asthma, and the study was between people that had standard agricultural, uh, lived in like the Amish community where they did regular, just old-fashioned farming, mm -hmm. and another community that did industrial farming. And they found that there was a higher incident of asthma and allergies in the children with industrial farming than in the children. And it had to do with the parents coming in from the field, bringing the field, mm -hmm. whatever, in so that the children were getting acclimatized to it, for one of a better word, mm -hmm. early on. Mm -hmm. And then the industrial, they took their clothes off in the barn and they changed before they went in the house, mm. so the children weren't getting any of that, the infants. Mm. Mm. And so I think it's 